This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 68 for January 29th, 2010. Hello, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow. Friday afternoon, time to talk about viruses. Joining me today from the western forests of Massachusetts is Alan Dove. That's the cold western forests of Massachusetts. It's really cold today, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it was nine when I got up this morning, and I, I haven't looked at the thermometer since. Nine Fahrenheit. Yeah. Got snow up there? Uh, yeah, we got snow last night. Actually, the roads were a sheet of ice. I was driving back from interviewing somebody in Boston and uh, got to Western Mass, and it was just lovely, solid ice. So. Better when you can just interview from the comfort of your home, isn't it? That, yeah, that is usually my preference, but it's uh, this is for a profile. Uh, yeah. Sometimes so. FaceTime is good, right? FaceTime is definitely good and very interesting researcher. And uh, just a little plug, it'll be in, uh, scheduled for the March issue of Nature Medicine. So Nature Medicine, we'll look for it. Excellent. Yeah. Maybe we'll make it a pick of the week. Oh, yeah. And also joining us from Florida, where there is no snow and it's not freezing, Rich Condit. Hey, good to be back. Is it 70 degrees and sunny down there? Uh, no, it's uh, 69 and sunny. Darn. <laughs> I, I hear I'll be down there in a couple of months. Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be it's great be, to have you. Of course, it'll we'll be May, May when the weather's okay here, but uh, uh, yeah, that's it's, okay. Uh, May's a nice time here. Maybe we'll Yeah, do winter's it. over. I, uh, we're done with winter. We had uh, winter a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you made the right decision uh, to go there. And we, it's, uh, and we didn't. I love it. Uh, we, we have winter for another two months here. Yeah. But we're not complaining. We uh, we like this for now. <laughs> Today we have great stories, so let's dive right into it. Let's dive into the pond, Rich. Okay. <laughs> we have three great stories. The first one I knew Rich would love. It's called Repulsion of Superinfecting Virions, a Mechanism for Rapid Virus Spread. This is a paper that just came out in science, and uh, it was brought to my attention by one of our listeners, Bjorn. So thanks for showing that to us, Bjorn. And do you love this paper, Rich? I do love this paper. This is, uh, this is really good. Uh, thanks, Bjorn, for bringing it to my attention. This is one of those things, you know, I should have known about, and I've been spouting off to people in my lab and stuff ever since, and of course they know about it. And mm. I don't know where I've been. But... It's right up your alley, right? Oh, it's great stuff. Uh, yeah, it's perfect. I mean, I, uh, right up my alley in a number of ways because one, I, I, I want to use this moment as a plug for very basic science because that's what this is. Jeff's not trying to cure a disease with this. He's just curious as to how things work. And it starts off with a very, very simple observation and comes up with some really interesting stuff. So, yeah, it's very good. So, so tell us about it, man. You're the man. Very quickly, once again, it, it involves uh, vaccinia virus, which is a pox virus. Uh, Double-stranded DNA-containing virus replicates in the cytoplasm, was used as the smallpox vaccine. Um, those details in this particular case are not necessarily all that uh, uh, important. What is important is that there's actually two infectious forms of the virus. Uh, both are enveloped. One, the envelope is manufactured by an intracellular process that we don't understand completely. That virus called intracellular mature virus, or IMV, stays in the cytoplasm. Uh, and in culture, at least, that's where most of the virus stays. There's a small percentage that acquires a second membrane. Uh, through a mechanism that involves first budding through the Golgi, which if you think about it topologically makes, means you pick up two more membranes, and then that particle is transported to the undersurface of the plasma membrane where the outermost membrane fuses with the plasma membrane, and the result is to exocytose a particle that's called extracellular enveloped virus. So that thing has the original IMV, which has a single membrane, and has a second membrane that was derived originally from the Golgi and is sitting on the outside of the cell. So uh, can I ask you, if, in an animal that's infected with this virus, is that the, the virus that transmits the infection, the double membrane virus? 
uh, it is thought that that is the uh, form of the virus that's responsible for cell to cell and tissue to tissue spread. Yes. Okay. Uh, we've talked in, on the show before about advantages and disadvantages of being a membrane or a non-membrane virus because a membrane virus theoretically is less um, less stable in the environment and a non-membrane virus is more stable. It's as if vaccinia has evolved two different forms of the virus to cover uh, all contingencies. Mm. One that's really stable, that's the IMV, and the other, the envelope type, uh, is really good for spread, although it may be, the outer envelope may be less stable. Mm. And where do you see what else it's evolved? So, uh, uh, going into this, it was also understood that um, the EEV, when it sits on the outside of the membrane, uh, what happens is there's a couple of other virus, several other virus proteins that are made that from the inside of the cell uh, triggers formation of an, a filament that is composed of actin filaments or cables that this filament is manufactured specifically to um, transmit the virus. So it's just the right diameter. So you have a single particle perched on the end of this filament that then projects out of the cell and is wafting around on the outside of the cell looking to deposit this virion on some neighboring cell. And it can effectively inject or at least place this virion onto some neighboring cell on the end of this actin filament. That's actually been known for a long time. There was a, there were some old micrographs by a guy named Stokes from 20 years before this was described in detail using uh, modern techniques that showed that these filaments with a particle uh, on the outside of them existed. Um, I want to go back for a minute and def I don't know if I've, on TWIV you've ever really spent any time talking about what a plaque is. I don't think so. You can uh, because you could do that, yeah. Plaques are my life. I, I, I love plaques. I do too, Rick. <laughs> we, we would not have virology without plaques. I'll tell you. Not in its current form. Right. So now we're not talking about the plaque on people's teeth. No. We're not talking about the plaque in brains of certain neurological diseases. No. And it's, and it's not an award you get. No. Okay. So... Though there was a Nobel Prize awarded for setting up a plaque assay. Yes, but that was a medal. Uh, yes, true. You okay. know, I've been called uh, out on that. Renato Del Becco. Yeah? Uh, I'm, I'm told his Nobel was for his con contributions to uh, RNA tumor virology. Okay. But I, I always go, thought I'll that too, there. but it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's important either way. Right. So... You're working with uh, animal viruses in culture. Uh, the, the cultured cells um, in a petri dish form a what we call a monolayer. That is uh, a layer of cells, a single cell thick, uh, where all the cells are. They're covering the dish completely, and they're all snuggled up to each other. It looks like a cobblestone street or something like that looking down at the top. So you have this single cell sheet on a dish. If you then drop a single infectious virus particle somewhere on that dish, it will infect a cell and produce viruses that can then infect surrounding cells. Those cells can produce viruses that then infect surrounding cells. And they tell two so, friends. <laughs> right. And so what happens is you get a center of infection that grows out where you have all these virus infected cells and you can detect them. Lots of times they're actually pulled away from the dish or they may be dead so they don't take up a vital dye or something like that. But in effect, you have a hole in the monolayer made by originally a single infectious unit of virus. That's a plaque. And we use plaque assays to help us quantify viruses. You can do a serial dilution and plate it out and count the plaques and calculate how many infectious units you had to start with. You can also use it to genetically purify viruses because if you isolate virus from the plaque, you know it started from something that was a unique single infectious particle. And I, th I think it would be correct to say that this is probably the oldest technique in virology, right? Uh, the oldest virus-specific technique, perhaps, yeah. This oh. was developed by de Harel working on bacteriophage in 1917, something like that. Right. Well, and, and didn't Fleming do it too? 
that I don't know. Are you, uh, can you comment on that, Vince? You're talking about Alexander Fleming, the discoverer yeah. of penicillin. No, I, I don't. I don't think so. My, my my understanding is that the the plaque assay for bacteriophages was developed in the, very early on. Okay, right. I'm not sure if if Darrell did it already or because I know that Max uh, Perutz, not Perutz, Max Delbruck and his colleagues made a big deal of it in the 1930s. Right, right. But uh, I think Darrell uh, uh, invented this in the in like 19 his first papers were in like 1917 1918 and they they described a lot of the original techniques right uh and then uh the phage guys like delbeco and luria took advantage of this made a big deal out of it and then in the uh in the 50s is when renato delbeco uh adapted it to animal viruses with polio virus mm, right that's right i just googled uh, alexander fleming plaque and i got a bunch of articles on all the plaques he received in yes no I, I just did the same thing and discovered i was i was wrong <laughs> okay okay so um uh let's see here um so going into this they knew about this uh actin filament uh stuff that i mentioned there was another um, observation about uh, uh, vaccinia virus that is common to many other viruses that was also known going into this, and that's a phenomenon called superinfection exclusion. So if you infect a cell with a virus and then come uh, with a vaccinia virus and then come in six, eight, nine hours later and try and infect it with another virus, another vaccinia virus, you can't do it, all right? And this actually requires gene expression from the first virus. So the first virus actively does something to prevent infection, uh, super infection, infection again by another uh, of the same virus. And I've always wondered why, you know, what's the point? Actually, it's done by a number of viruses, right? Right. Yeah. right. It's a very common phenomenon. Yeah. And, and I've never quite understood, uh, you know, why bother in particular uh, excluding infection by the same virus. One of the cool things about this paper is that it actually provides a, a sort of an answer to that why question. So this starts with the observation, very simple observation, that plaques made by vaccinia virus grow faster, they become, they grow in diameter faster than can be accounted for by the replication of the virus. So the virus replication cycle takes, I don't know, uh, 12 hours, call it. And uh, if you do a lot of calculations as to uh, how fast a plaque should grow based on that replication cycle and then observe the growth of the plaques, they're growing too fast to account for that. And so they ask the simple question, how does that work? This starts out in the paper with um, a quick time movie that, as I told Vince in an email, makes me want to cry. <laughs> it's a, uh, a motion picture. Uh, it's an, a, a photomicrograph of a plaque growing. So you look down on this and you can see the monolayer of cells and you can see uh, a couple of cells are infected and then you can see the boundary of this plaque moving out and what we call cytopathic effect, morphological changes in the cells catalyzed by the virus infection uh, that take place as the plaque grows. And there are several other movies uh, in this paper that elaborate on this uh, same phenomenon. I'm going to use these movies in my teaching. They're, they're just amazing. They're stunning. This is what I've been thinking about. Well, one of the things, my whole career, plaques and how plaques forms. And whenever I teach, I always have trouble explaining it. And now I can show this movie. Right. Well, I've, you know, I got pictures of plaques, but the movie yeah. really does it. Well, my, I told my colleague Saul Silverstein this morning, he showed me some series of pictures that they have taken of a, uh -huh. of a plaque, you know, by immunofluorescence, showing one cell infected, then three, then ten, you know. But this is a movie. Yeah, it's and cool. I, It's probably worth saying that the way they did this, they put a plate of cells on a microscope in a little incubated box, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they would always be looking at the same cells, but they had to apply the, the higher temperature and the buffering and all that. And then they took a, a frame every so often. Right. This is beautiful. Uh, this sort of live 
video micro uh, micrography, I guess you'd call it. Um, wow. Yeah, you I just, just downloaded the video. <laughs> <laughs> you just got, isn't that great? The first one is the black and white of the plaque yeah. growing. That's fabulous. And, uh, the fourth one, uh, they also do this with a virus that's uh, making a structural protein that's fused to green fluorescent protein, uh, which has the advantage of you can do the you can track the fluorescence uh, in real time on live images. And so, if you look at uh, Alan, if you look at movie number four, you can see the leading edge of a plaque move out on the dish, and the cells turn green behind it. And one of the points there is that this fusion that they've made is to a a late gene product, and uh, so it's not expressed until late during infection. So you can see the cytopathic effect, a morphological change, at the leading edge of the plaque as it grows out. But those cells aren't green; the green cells. Uh, the cells turn green, and you can actually focus on individual cells and watch it happen. The cells turn green later as the virus infection reaches the late stage. And so this is actually part of the picture that we need to develop here, and that is that at the leading edge of a plaque, you have a sort of a gradient of infection, where at the very leading edge, it's the early phase of infection. And as you move back towards the center of the plaque, the cells uh, you're going backwards in time, and you're uh, later in infection. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I'm the, sorry, it, you didn't say anything to me, did you? I've just been. I'm, I'm playing this movie. Here. It's all right, I, no I just problem. Keep playing it. Yeah, did you get the movie number four yet? Uh, no, I'm still stuck on number one. It, okay, it's so right. awesome. Well, you, <laughs> I, we you can post, a, we can post yeah. this to the Twiv site, right, Vince? I did. I emailed Jeff uh, today and asked him, and he said it would be. He thought it would be okay. Uh, well, listen. I also last night, uh, just for kicks, uh, from my home computer, which has no university privileges or anything, access this science magazine, and it's open access. It is. The videos are open access. Yeah. Oh, they able, they yeah, always are. Yeah. 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 The home. the supplemental data are always open access. So I think they're always open access. At least every time I've had a need oh, to good. go to supplemental data. So I was able to get Great. Yeah, I was able to get all that stuff from home. All right, we'll put we'll link it uh, from Twiv absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This is good. We this is going to be hard to describe. So <laughs> the the fundamental observation in this paper is that okay, so we've always thought about this as cells are infected, they make EEV the EEV is exocytosed and sits on the surface of the cells, and then you make these actin filaments that push the EEV around and maybe push it into another uninfected cell. Mm -hmm. Turns out it's cooler than that. Some of the proteins that the virus makes, and this is what this paper shows, some of the proteins that the virus makes that are uh, responsible for forming these uh, forming these uh, actin filaments are actually made early during the virus infection. So you can have a cell that's infected with virus, and at an early time before you're way before you're making any new virus, the proteins to make the actin filaments are there. If you then drop onto that cell. A, an EEV virus particle from another cell that will nucleate formation of an actin filament. And the actin filament will grow out and push this particle around and, and could uh, then put that particle into another cell. Mm -hmm. But remember, there's super infection exclusion. So you got this actin filament coming from a, a cell that was infected very early, uh, early in infection, it's not making its own particles. That particle came from a cell behind it in the plaque that was uh, making uh, virus particles and passed this to this uh, cell early in infection, further out on the edge of the plaque. You make an actin filament. Oh, oh, when that particle was passed out to the infected cell, it might have tried to infect it, but it couldn't. Super mm -hmm. exclusion. So instead, you get an actin filament, and that pushes this particle out. Maybe it tries to infect another cell that's already infected. No, that's not going to work. It'll make another actin filament, pass it along until it finds an uninfected cell and infect that guy. So basically, you can think of it, I've heard the word used, surfing. Mm -hmm. Virus so surfing. Virus yep. particles that are made in late infected cells are passed to another cell, if it's already infected, 
uh, but not making virus particles. It can't be super infected, but it does, since it's already infected, catalyze the formation of these actin filaments, which then passes it along, passes it along until you find an uninfected cell. So when and the virus gets into the cell, one of the first things it does is hang out a sign that says, go to next cell. It hangs out a sign, exactly. Not only says, go to next cell, but provides uh, the transportation. Right. All right? So terrific. So that, you got virus surfing ahead of the infection on the edge of the plaque, and they and and that's why the plaque gets bigger, you know, uh, more rapidly than can be accounted for by the virus infection. So the explanation for this is that you you're more efficiently infecting cells. You don't want to waste viruses in a cell that's already infected. Right. Exactly. And that's and that's the explanation also for super infection exclusion. Why infect a cell that's already infected? Use those virions uh, to uh, infect other cells that aren't infected. In fact, that has uh, implications. I mean, like I said, this is very basic stuff. This is just, I don't, well, I don't know what these guys were thinking, but knowing Jeff, my guess is he was saying, hmm, and that's about it, right? And that, and that <laughs> <laughs> precipitated the whole thing. It's just, I mean, can you imagine? Just even taking the movie, just for kicks. Hey, let's take a movie of a plaque growing. Uh, this is, I mean, you would sit there and you would watch that and you'd say, my God, what's going on? I've always right? wanted to do that. I yeah. have always wanted to take movies of infected cells, but I don't have the equipment to do it. And he does, apparently. So, the, And I would like to now, I want to go and buy one of these things right. and do it with the viruses we work with, because I'll bet it's, it's a more oh, universal phenomenon than we think. Well, the not. prices are coming down on incubator scopes where you can do these time-lapse experiments. Yeah, this I, need a great the, exa I need the incubator. I, I have a scope. I need the incubator that goes on it. Yeah, they've got these combination units now where you get the scope that can combine with the incubator or you can put the incubator on the scope. Yeah, got to do it. Great example of a new technology that allows you to look at an ancient observation with a, 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 in a whole new way right? Uh, and, and come up with new stuff. So... Even though this is, I would assume, start, started off as just a very basic observation, it has profound implications for virus spread during an infection in an animal, sure, okay? Yes, sure. Because this enhances the efficiency of the infection by not wasting virions. Send them on ahead to an uninfected cell. And because this is a mechanism that has, um, that has evolved repeatedly in viruses, this is, a, this is a target that nobody's ever looked at. Right. That could be useful for a variety of viruses. I mean, if you can sure. stop, um, if you can stop this kind of thing in different viruses, you can slow spread and maybe let the <laughs> immune system win. Now, here's my question: He identified uh, two viral proteins that are critical for this repulsion, right? Right. He took them. He took them away from the virus. He deleted them genetically. Is that correct? Yes. What would you? Uh, is that right? No, actually. Uh, what he did? Well, no, wait a minute. Maybe they had some deletions. I forget. I have to look at the paper here. Let's assume. Paper. Let's say he did delete them. Which I know say, what he did do was he put them under the control of a late promoter rather than an early promoter. Right. right. And showed that it didn't. That the plaques got smaller. So if you took that virus, what would be the prediction in an animal? Would it have a slower development of disease or none? I, maybe. Great question. Uh, uh, you know, my guess is that that experiment is cooking. I hope it is. You listening, Jeff? Uh, uh, because you know, the prediction would be if this really does have relevance to um, uh, a virus in vivo. Now, actually, some of those experiments have probably been done. I should look them up because I think in some of these cases you can. I I didn't review all this stuff. I think in some of these cases, you can make knockouts of these viruses. And I think the virulence experiments have been done. And I can, I can check it, but my guess is the yeah. knockouts are reduced in virulence. That's an important experiment, right? To validate these as, an, say, an antiviral target of some kind. Right. right. But remember, remember, you're looking at uh, you, you, these uh, proteins are, in a sense, multifunctional because yeah. on the, they make the primary actin filaments that uh, uh, eject the virus or project the virus from the cell that's actually making the original virion. Right. And they're actually responsible for making the actin filaments uh, downstream. But now I think he differentiates between these at some 
uh, point in the uh, in the paper, and I'd have to review that again as well. But these these are all great questions, hmm. and my guess is that um, uh, these viruses will be attenuated in uh, in animals. I think the experiments have already been done. Of course, it would be because we don't need to cure vaccinia infections, but other viruses need to be looked at now and to see whether they have similar viral proteins that do this and whether they could be targets. Right. I'm really glad that science published this. Yeah. Um, you know, they tend to be publishing the hot swine flu type paper, right, mm -hmm. which is medically relevant. But this is basic science, but at least they saw the wide applicability. So right. there, there is some hope over there. <laughs> oh, now, now. Science does some good stuff. <laughs> well, that's why you're here to defend it. It's okay. Yeah. No, they do very good stuff, but you know what? The whole world should be able to read this paper, but they can't. Well, right? well no, actually, if they got a computer, they can. I think it's open access. If it's open access, that's great. Uh, the paper itself? I don't know. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I tried that at home or not, but somehow I got the supplementary figures. I don't know which uh, link I... Supplementary uh, figures I got with no trouble. Nope, I'm getting a login screen. All right. Ah. The okay. world can hear about it through TWIV. Let's put yes. it that way. We will report to you what you cannot read because it's behind the the wall of uh, profitability. Now I'm getting a little cynical now. Well, you know, I, I pay my mortgage by the profitability of journals. So yeah, I understand. You, they have to make money, but they, they, do, they do need to keep the lights on. That's but, what we're uh, that's what we're here for to tell if you they about can, it. If they can find a uh, a business model that allows them to give open access to this stuff and support it with advertising and page. Uh, page fees, then I'm all for it. One day. Yeah. Um, so I have one final question about this. Uh, in, in his email with me, Jeff Smith said about that for, that movie showing the growth of the plaque. He said, it's like a stone being dropped into a pond. So why is that, Rich? Do you have any? Well, it just looks like it to me if you look at the movie. Why, okay? is, it that, why is it that you get this expanding ring? Is that just refraction happening? Is it oh yeah, I mean that's the it's the cytopathic it's the cytopathic pa, cytopathic effect. The cells first thing they do is kind of uh, round up and become more refractile, and you see that in the uh, in the microscope. And okay. and in fact, that's a the, there's. Uh, well, different viruses cause different cytopathic effects, and the, they they look different. But um, there's a a couple of different phases to the cytopathic effect in vaccinia. One's called early cell rounding. So early during the cytopathic effect, the cells round up, they become more refractile, and then they sort of flatten out again and do other things so that they lose that particular characteristic. So as the plaque grows out, you see this boundary of that early cytopathic effect, the refractility uh, sort, of, sort of moving out. Uh, I just uh, PubMedded an article here, and yes, at least uh, one of these proteins is A33, and if you knock it out, the virus is attenuated. Nice. And I'm sure that's the same with these other guys as well. Yeah, it makes sense. So that uh, this is not only involved in super infection exclusion, but it's involved in spread. Yep. Helping the virus spread. Right. Which is, uh, so the two are, are intimately linked. Right. Nice. Very nice stuff. Good job, Jeff. We'll tell Jeff to listen to this episode. He would like yeah. it. Maybe his ears are ringing at the moment. All right. Now, we have two other stories. I don't know if we'll get to them both. But before we do, I'd like to chat about the sponsors of this episode, our friends at datarobotics.com, the makers of Drobo. And if you head on over to drobo.com slash twiv, you'll see they made a nice landing page for TWIV listeners. Dr Data Robotics make backup solutions for your computer. They make a, um, I shouldn't call it an appliance. They make a... a um, well, it is an appliance. Is it? It that's is? Not, that's, not a, um, that's not a disparaging term, okay. I don't think. It's an appliance that will help you keep your data secure, whether your data are pictures or movies, TV shows, or if it's sequenced data from your lab or protocols or episodes of TWIV, episodes of TWIV, lab results, you it will be secure on a Drobo because it's a multi-drive device that is uh, redundant. Anytime a drive fails, uh, you simply replace it with a new one and the missing data are backed up automatically. And I've used Drobos for years every day. I love them. I just got one for my lab, and 
we're in the process of setting it up. So I'll tell you all about what I'm doing as soon as the drives come in. And I, I've always talked about Drobo on this show as a, a backup solution, but they do have a new model, which is called the Drobo S. And the Drobo S has a faster interface than the original model. So you can hook it up via a fast firewire or eSATA interface. And that means you can not only use it for backup, but you can actually work on files on it. You could edit, say, audio files or movie files or Photoshop files. It's fast enough to be able to do that. So you have both the security of data backup and you can have the speed that you need to work on a file that's large. Now, Drobo is being wonderful to TWIV listeners. We have discounts available if you'd like to purchase a Drobo, either a Drobo or a Drobo S. You can get 50 or $100 off of these models. You go over to uh, drobo.com slash TWIV, and there's a link to the store. And you use the promotional code VINCENT, capital letters, to get that discount. And I mentioned last week that we are going to have a couple of contests to give away three Drobo S models. So this is actually a five-drive model with a fast interface. Very nice product. I don't have one myself yet. But we're going to have three different contests, and we're going to pick a winner each month, and you'll get a Drobo for free. And all of these details are going to be at twiv.tv. So the first contest we're starting today, and by the, next, by the end of the next three or four weeks, we'll announce a winner. And here's what you need to do to enter this contest. You have to go over to iTunes and subscribe to TWIV, which is This Week in Virology. So just subscribe to the podcast. It's free. And then leave a review. So on the TWIV site at iTunes is a place where you can leave reviews. And we like reviews because they help keep us on the front page of the medicine podcasts at iTunes, and that way more people see us. And then what you have to do, I will send out a tweet. Uh, a few times this week on Twitter, announcing the contest, we'd like you to retweet it, which means to send it out again. It's called RTing in the Twitterverse. I'll put details of all of this at twiv.tv. And then we will randomly select one of the retweets from uh, Twitter, and that will that person will receive the award. Okay, so basically go to iTunes, subscribe to Twiv, leave a review, and then retweet my tweet this is very complex <laughs> to get in the contest. This will probably be the easiest contest uh, requirements of all three. But anyway, do that. Go over to twiv.tv. I'll list uh, the, all these details again and get in there. It's very easy to do. You just have to get your name in there and you could win a Drobo S, which would be wonderful. It's a good machine. Of course, we thank Drobo for their support of this week in virology. Our second story is another. Uh, hang on, can I interrupt oh, just for a you second? You could anytime, sure. All right. Uh, I just want to back up and make one correct, one very important omission. Sure. We talked about that science paper and we talked about Jeff Smith. He's the senior author on the paper. We should mention the people who really did the work. Oh, yes. uh, the first two authors are Virginia <laughs> Ducell, I think it is, and I've, pardon me if I'm mispronouncing that, and Michael Hollinshead, and uh, they are cited as equal contributors, and then there's uh, Lanique van der Linden, and then Jeff Smith. Uh, it's real easy to always cite the lab head, but uh, there are, uh, the first authors are the people who really did the did the work absolutely the no thanks for, thanks for doing that as a podcast on virology for the people we should be very cognizant of that and uh we'll we'll uh hope that they listen to this episode as well great work guys our second story is another uh story oriented around a pox virus and i just this caught my eye and you know whenever rich is on i, I look for pox virus stories because i know he loves them <laughs> and uh, this is um Actually, this is a, a big story going back a number of years. It's attempting to treat prostate cancer uh, using a canary pox virus vector. Actually, they use several pox virus vectors in these studies. It was an article I'd first seen on Reuters, and then I went back into the literature and found a quite, quite a bit more as well. And I actually hadn't 
paid much attention to this over the years. Um, apparently, there are a number of cancers which have specific antigens, uh, and you can try and target those antigens by generating an immune response using a virus vector. So in the study that um, was what came out on Rutgers, this is a study out of... Um, Reuters. Is it Reuters? Yes. What did I say, Rutgers? Rutgers, that's yeah. a university in New Jersey. I certainly know that. This is, this is a collaborative study, which um, in part is done by a company that is a subsidiary of Bavarian... What's the second? Bavarian Nordic, yes. Which, and we did a story on them recently, right, Rich? Right, they're making because the, they're making the, the MVA-based smallpox vaccine. That's right. So apparently this is a pox company. Uh, yeah, well, they, I think they do more than just pox, but they're heavily invested in... Uh, that's a large percentage of what they do now. Well, in this paper, they, take, they did a phase two clinical trial of uh, pox viruses that contain... PSA, prostate-specific antigen, which is a protein found on prostate cells as well as uh, cancerous prostate cells. Uh, and the idea is that you immunize, and these are patients that have prostate cancer, so it's a therapeutic vaccine. It's not a preventative. Right. Um, and the idea is you immunize them. And, and in this study, they just wanted to see if the people lived longer. So they had already done a phase one to, de to demonstrate safety and now they are looking to see if they live longer and the they it's it's not just psa in these vectors somebody exploded uh i hope it wasn't me alan you there did i uh i'm here oh uh, we're all back did you hear that hissing i do yeah it's gone for me now i wonder if it's something here blowing up did somebody open a page? I opened a page for Bavaria Nordic, but I don't think it had any sound on no, it. No, now it's going away. It's still very, maybe mm. it's, let me see if it's me. I'm going to turn my volume down. Yeah. I think something uh, happened out in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> sounded like, it was loud. Uh, it sounded like CO2 or nitrogen, you know, coming yeah. out of a tank. Oh, dear. Well, TWIV must go on. So they don't, they not only give, um, vectors, uh, pox virus vectors that have PSA in them, but they also have what are called co-stimulatory molecules. So the idea is with these vaccines, what they're trying to do is to stimulate T cells uh, that are specific for PSA so that they'll go to the cancer cells and kill them. Did I get that right, guys? Yep. Yep. So these, they put in these three proteins, which have been shown to really be good at uh, helping to generate these uh, T cells. So you don't need just an antigen to generate a good T cell. You need to have these co-stimulatory molecules, which I believe are in the cell that presents the antigen, right? They're in the, so you, you infect with these viral vectors, the, the cells express PSA and the co-stimulatory molecule, and then the T cells come along and recognize all that. Right. And they're very right. happy to have the, the co-stimulatory molecules as well as the antigen. Right. So the, and in fact, if you go back and look at other similar studies that are being done, they all use these co-stimulatory molecules. They really help confer specificity and, and affinity to the response. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that they have they have to use two different um, pox virus vectors. Did you pick up on that, Rich? Yep, they started off with a vaccinia vector and followed up with several immunizations with foul pox. And what they say is that it um, uh, the the rationale for that is that immunity to the first vector compromises its reuse, right. uh, and so they use uh, a, an immunologically uh, different uh, vector, and that uh, gives a, a better boost off the first one. Right, that makes sense, right? Yeah, Which is absolutely. an interesting. That's an interesting problem. The this same vector, I gather, is um, is the basis for uh, Bavarian Nordic's um, smallpox vaccine. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the first vector, well, the first vector they say is vaccinia. Uh, uh, I didn't look into exactly what strain of vaccinia it is, but uh, I don't think it's MVA because it's been around 
but this has been under development for a very long time. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it started out in uh, a company that uh, uh, Dennis Panicali had a leadership role in called Therion Biologics. And I watched him for years come to pox virus meetings and give report after report of these various vectors trying to do this. And they were all very discouraging. Um, hmm. uh, the, this is a, a this reminds me very much of the AIDS trial that we discussed recently, where you have a couple of therapies that haven't really worked, uh, but you put them together in a logical fashion and you get an effect. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge effect, uh, but, but it's an effect. So this is the, uh, after a, a long and really bloody history. This is one of the uh, first successes of this I've seen. And in the meantime, interestingly, Therion Biologics has gone under. And the whole thing, they say here at the, in the end of the introduction that it was uh, started under, originated under industrial sponsorship uh, with the NCI, the original industrial sponsor, Therion Biologics, managed the trial through treatment, primary endpoint evaluation, and one year um, uh, follow up. And then it was passed on to Bavarian Nordics. Okay, because Therion mm. went, yeah. went belly up. Right. I just, I just drilled down to the Prostvac specifications on the BN website, and you're right. It's not the it's not the same vector. It's not the MVA vector that they're using for their other vaccines. Right. And then, of course, the second one is, a, is an avipox, a bird pox vector. In this case, uh, they say foul pox. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, Dennis Panicali is on this paper, by the way. Yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. Because uh, he, uh, you know, he was instrumental in developing these things all, the whole time he was at Therion. I tried to, I don't know where he is now. Dennis, if you're listening, give me a, Give me a shout and tell me what's going on. Yeah. Interesting. Well, here they have some effect. Um, yes. They have a 44% reduction in death rate. These are people with quite advanced cancers. So they're, Yeah, they're, and clinical trials, clinical trials, you have to start with people who, yeah. this is kind of their last shot, their, right? Their last shot, right? Yeah, this, is, this was a phase two trial, so you, you want to choose people who... Everything else has failed. Right. Yeah. And then they had an yeah. uh, eight and a half month improvement in the median survival. So they lived, some of them lived that much. They longer. actually say that the trial was set up to try and measure what they call pro progression free survival, which is a shorter term measure that says that after a certain period of time, uh, you, your disease has stopped progressing and they say they didn't see any difference there. Mm -hmm. And at that point they, uh, unblinded the trial and gave the controls the opportunity to have the real thing and then continued the study on beyond, uh, it's that initial design endpoint uh and it turned out that in the long run the overall survival they did see a difference so they didn't see a difference in the uh, uh progression uh, but they did see in the long term a, a, a difference in the uh, overall survival mm -hmm. yeah. a, a problem with these uh, sorts of trials where I mean, you have to do ethically, you have to do it that way in people with advanced disease. But of course, it makes, it puts the worst, the most stringent sort of constraints on the trials. You, you would yeah, hope sure, sure. it stacks you, the deck against you. It yeah. stacks the deck against you. You would hope it would work better in, in people who were just diagnosed. Right. Yeah, right. Sure. But you don't give, you don't give a, a highly experimental drug to people who are just diagnosed. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, the phase three, they'll be able to broaden the population, I would assume. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Show, because this showed f some efficacy. Yeah, I would think you could do that yeah. and get more numbers. They they conclude uh, these data are statistically and potentially clinically meaningful, but they are regarded as hypothesis generating. I like that. Yes, very interesting. <laughs> A larger pivotal phase three trial is planned. I mean, in my view, I, I don't know the the way to interpret these very well, but the, the results look reasonably good to me even. Right. So it sounds well, promising. as I say, much like the HIV trial, this has been uh, 
something that's been going on for a long time has been very, very, very frustrating. I, I congratulate the people who've put so much effort into this because uh, it's heroic to continue on with something like this in the face of so much disappointment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is the first real um, success that they've had. Yeah. What's, what I find interesting is that they mentioned that you don't get any antibodies produced against. Right. The, it's a cellular uh, response. It's a cellular, re which is probably what you want to get rid of the cells, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that's that's been that's been a problem for cancer vaccines. Is you're trying to induce primarily a cellular response. Yeah. Uh, well, and the I guess thing the, the Dendrion um, is the the other company doing this, and their approach is actually to um, uh, it's a cell based approach. They take the the immune cells and then you know right manipulate them right. to, to stimulate the response and then reinfuse them. Right. They actually take dendritic cells out of people. Right. Which are can be antigen presenting, right? And they put the antigen they load them with peptides, I think. Right. And then they put them back in. Very now if that approach, you know, it's gonna come down to which one works better, of course, but um if they both end up working similarly, then I would expect the Prostvac would probably pull out ahead. Um mm. As you wouldn't have to engineer each patient's custom therapy. Right, right. right. So inherently yeah. it would be more cost-effective and, and efficient. I found a great review at uh, Nature Medicine. Now, Nature, Micro Nature Reviews Microbiology, uh, which has a beautiful chart of um, all the uh, cancer vaccines that are in trials or being pre-trialed right now. And there are quite a few. One is... Um, Carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA. Mm -hmm. This is a widely expressed uh, antigen on cancer cells. And there they're using vaccinia and ALVAC. What's that again, Rich? ALVAC? Uh, that's uh, another avipox virus. ALVAC, I ALVAC, think, is canary pox. Right. Or FPV, which is... Is foul pox virus. Foul pox. So, and then, so those are two different bird poxes. Then there are two... There's another one for colorectal, renal, and prostate cancer, which is an antigen called 5T4, and that's being done in uh, MVA. There's, okay. there's a lung cancer antigen, MUC1, which is done in MVA. There's a melanoma antigen called MART1, which is done in a lentivirus vector. Yeah, those are the ones that are listed on this table. So there are quite a few being worked on by a variety of companies here, in addition to the NIH. So, so the whole cancer vaccine thing, I don't know if you want to get into this, but it it's it's a a bit of a mystery to me because some of these antigens like prostate specific antigens uh are things that are there yeah <laughs> normally so that's self right that's right so we're somehow tricking the immune system to react against what otherwise would look as self yeah now in some other cases, like I think carcinoembryonic antigen, you're looking at, at proteins that are embryonic proteins that are uh, expressed on cancer cells. And so as embryonic proteins, uh, you, may not have a, uh, you may not recognize those as self. They show up as foreign on the cancer cell, if I understand this correct. Correct me if yeah. I'm wrong. This is, this is a, another one of the ongoing problems with cancer vaccines is that ultimately you're trying to to stimulate a response against self antigens in many cases. Uh, but the, the carcinoembryonic antigens, I think um, there's pretty good evidence that they are not expressed in adult cells generally. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. I don't know much yeah. about this. this. That's why I picked this. I thought it was very interesting, and our listeners would like it. So there is uh, there are some conundra here, and yeah. I don't understand why you would get T cells against this. I'm not sure anyone understands, but if anyone knows, let us know. Oh, I just noticed at the end of this yeah. that uh, Dennis Panicali is listed as his affiliation is BM, BN Immunotherapeutics. And so he moved to that so company. So he moved to them. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. That's good. Yeah, I guess he's you know invested in this uh, in many ways. Yeah. So he wants yeah, to he's see got, it. Yeah, he's got years in this, and so do a lot of these other people. Yeah, sure. It's cool. All right. I think uh, in the, in the uh, interest of time, we should move on to email. What do you think, gentlemen? Sure. Sounds we'll, good to me. We'll, we'll save the last story till next week. We have a couple of good ones. Uh, okay, Ken writes, in TWIV60, when Dick asks why all RNA viruses don't have positive sense genome, Vince replies that this isn't known. <laughs> I've always thought, I'd always thought that the disadvantage of a positive sense virion genome 
is that eukaryotic messages are monocystronic. So if you're going to have your genome translated, you only get one polypeptide, either a polyprotein or your own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The former puts some serious constraints on coding, and the latter means that all you've done is brought in the template for the negative sense RNA. Whereas if you have a negative sense genome, the polymerase you bring into the host cell can efficiently transcribe different messages off the genome in a more easily regulated fashion. Have I been oversimplifying? Well, you know, I've heard you comment on this before, uh, Vince, and, mm. and I, I basically agree that my, ultimately the answer to these questions is it works. Yeah, they do. Nature has, nature has tried everything, uh, and both of these things work. You can play teleological games with saying why one might have an advantage over another, and the sort of reasoning that he uses in here uh, is perfectly consistent with those sorts of teleological games. But in the end, both are successful strategies. Right. And so they've, uh, I, well, they're successful strategies, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Yeah, I agree. I think that, I, I like his idea. It's a good idea. But as yeah. you say, both virus types are around, so right. I'm not sure that uh, it makes a difference. Tom writes, hello, I love your podcast. I'm a pediatrician and feel the need to correct a misspeak. In episode 63, you said smallpox is the only disease that we have eradicated. I think you meant smallpox is the only vaccine-preventable disease that we have eradicated. Certainly, we are not omniscient enough to know whether there are diseases out there we have not discovered that have been eradicated. Keep up the good work and the bad jokes. Well, <laughs> if a disease is eradicated in the forest and nobody was vaccinated against it, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought you were saying that about the bad jokes. No, no, no. <laughs> Those we can't do anything about. Well, thanks for writing, Tom. We appreciate it. It's from Wisconsin. Spencer writes, I am playing rapid catch-up with the TWIV series and anxiously await more TWIP episodes. I've already bought Dick's Parasite book and read most of it. I'm a practicing physician in central New Jersey. I have a lipid referral center for complex cholesterol patients. This special interest came after a switch from the research world to the clinical world, I received a doctorate in pharmacology at Mount Sinai 20 years ago. During the 90s, when I was a medical student and resident at Georgetown, almost every hospital patient had an opportunistic infection as a result of HIV's destruction of their immune system. Infectious organisms, previously seen as a once-in-a-career event, became routine clinical findings on the wards. Since heart these patients have been healthier and have not needed hospitalization. Thus, there was a unique period of time where we saw some really interesting things that newer physicians will never see. Yeah, I've heard that from another of, a number of other physicians as well. As a result of your podcast series, I'm enlightening my colleagues with details about the diseases we see and treat every day. It is amazing how much of a disconnect there is between clinical medicine and the science behind it. Keep up the excellent work. You have inspired me. What do you think about a series TWIC, This Week in Cholesterol? The amount of vascular <laughs> biology science that needs to be disseminated to the public as well as to physicians is enormous. Are you Dick and Alan free? <laughs> it's a good idea. I mean, I think people would probably like it. Right? Yeah, Especially but my, my knowledge of cholesterol biology would fill the first 30 seconds of the first episode, I think. <laughs> yeah, me too, but you could ask dumb questions. Yeah, right? you that's right. Dumb questions. right. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer, for writing. Philippe writes, hi, Twiv. I would like to add a few comments about the endogenous Borna virus. Were you on that show, Rich? Uh, no, but I did. I listened to it and I commented on it. I think that's how okay. that went. So this is a response to that because we were saying, why wasn't this picked up years ago? So Philippe says, here is how Swiss Prot missed it. So he works at Swiss Prot, which is a great, um, it's a Swiss, it's, it's in Geneva. It's a, a genome center with a great website, uh, Viral Zone. Um, only one locus of endogenous bornavirus N protein is expressed according to EST and was manually curated in 2003. Even though a human genome curator identified the protein as similar to B BDVN, he wrote a line about possible transposon. Being not familiar with virology, he did not know that what a bornavirus is and couldn't imagine something else that a other than a retrovirus inside a human genome. I, this is interesting, isn't it? So you have to curate sequences, right? Which right. means that someone looks at it and writes down what they think it is. And that's susceptible to human error. Absolutely. So that's pretty cool. 
On a side note, I searched in our Swiss Pro database for any other examples of genome insertion for other negative strand RNA viruses. I did not find anything. I, so we had said, hey, what else is there? So thanks right. for looking. Born of viruses replicating in the nucleus, unlike other mononegaviralis, and that may be a factor facilitating its integration. I found eventually a BDV phosphoprotein-like sequence in a set of cDNA sequences from a Gaboon Viper venom gland. The alignment is pretty good. Since the sequencing studies were performed on cDNA, one cannot exclude that an infectious bornavirus may have been present in the sample, but that seems unlikely to me. That's a snake, right? Yep. Yes. So I didn't know that bornavirus replicated in the nucleus. Shame on me. Yeah, it did. But that but, uh, that really adds a lot to the story. But so does influenza virus, ah, and, and that's why we said look for others, and he didn't find it. So I don't know if being in the nucleus is all you need, right? Or if there's something else going something on. Something else, because the idea is that the cellular reverse transcriptases are copying it, right? Right. But those would be in the cytoplasm, no? Or maybe they would get back in the nucleus after they're made. I'm, I'm not sure how that would work. So I don't know if being in the nucleus matters because of the flu issue. Anyway, he says, we love your podcast. Kind regards. Thank you, Philippe, for writing. We love uh, Viral Zone. You guys over there are great. Keep up the good work. If you haven't yep. checked it out, it was a pick once on Twiv. It's a really nice site. Very nice site. Now, for the final few emails, um, I started getting a bunch of emails, which all seem to come from a virology course at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So I went to the website and found that the instructor had told the students to listen to an episode of TWIV and uh, summarize it for the course and then submit a, a question to the program via email and copy the instructor. So that's where these emails have been coming to. And he writes, which I think is really nice, the objective is to familiarize you with the way that virologists think and approach problems to help you understand the integrative nature of the science of virology. So we let's read a couple of these emails. And we have a bunch more, which we'll spread out over the next few weeks. Nate, which was the first one I got, wrote, Dear Virology Guys, I am an undergraduate student, <laughs> and I am taking my first virology class this summer. Episode 67 was the first TWIV that I listened to, and I really enjoyed all the subjects that were discussed. I was mostly interested in the prion discussion, because I have never heard of them before. I was intrigued by Susan Lindquist's discovery with phenotypic changes in yeast due to prions. I was wondering what type of phenotypic changes would a yeast cell undergo if it enters an environment that it considers to be unfavorable? And if in favorable conditions, would prions be active in changing yeast phenotypes as well? I just find it amazing that prions have the capability to change an organism so quickly so that the organism can adapt to a different environment. Well, that's a great question. And since I don't know yeast prions that well, I asked Mark Pelletier, who was on TWIV uh, during that episode, and he wrote, here's the short answer. Linquist experimentally tested 100 potential prion-like proteins, found 19 that were capable of forming prions. MOT3, the name of one of them, was shown to form prions in a natural context. Quoting from the paper, which is Alberti et al. 2009, at least one of these prion proteins, MOT3, produces a bona fide prion in its natural context that increases population level phenotypic heterogeneity. The self-perpetuating states of these proteins present a vast source of heritable phenotypic variation that increases the adaptability of yeast populations to diverse environments. MOT3P, which is the protein, is a globally acting transcription factor that modulates a variety of processes, including mating, carbon metabolism, and stress response. MOT3P also tightly represses anaerobic genes such as DAN1 during aerobic growth. So Mark says, by converting MOT3P to the prion state, in which case it's inactive, it sequesters a functional globally acting transcription activator. Modulating global gene expression leads to many different phenotypes. So these are amazing. Uh, I don't know if either of you guys have read much about these yeast prions. but No, I have not. No. So they can they allow the yeast to adapt to any weird environment, you know, lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients, stress, carbon, mating even. <laughs> they can change phenotypically very quickly because it's the protein that is there and you don't have to express a gene and, and so forth. And uh, Lindquist is one of the um, 
uh, main drivers in this area. And she has found a bunch of these proteins in yeast, in which, which some of which, even under normal conditions, uh, allow it to uh, just grow properly when, cha when things change slightly. So we'll put a link to these papers in this review article in there, Nate, uh, so you can get more detailed info. I have a question. So sure. I don't when know if we I say can it's answer a, it. But when we say it's a bona fide prion, um, I mean, to me, one of the characteristics of a prion is, or that I think of, is infectivity. Mm -hmm. So you could take this protein from one cell and put it into another cell and cause the transformation in the other cell. Do these do that? No, they remain in the cell. They, they're, let me pull up this, um, this article so I can give you her words because I'm not, certainly not the expert in this. We have prions. Here we go. There's a great, there's a great review article in, um, what is this journal here? I can't read the type. It's too small. Uh, TCB, Trends in Cell Biology, Prions, Protein, Homeostasis, and Phenotypic Diversity. So she says, prions are fascinating. The traditional association of the mammalian prion with disease has overshadowed a potentially more interesting attribute of their prion, of prions, their ability to create protein-based molecular memories. So they mm. just remain in the yeast. They don't go to another yeast. Okay. And they act as switches. Basically, they can react to environmental conditions very quickly. And okay, so it's an autocatalytic conformational change. Into, yeah. And where you have two, two different um, functional states uh, that right. can be uh, propagate right. each other. That's okay. right. That's what. It, that's why it's a prion because you can go okay. between these two states, and uh, and then the self. There's a self templating state, the amyloid state where it can make other copies of the protein mimic it, fold in the same way. And do these yeast prions actually do an amyloid type thing? They make fibrils, yeah. Okay. Yep, they do. Cool. And she's found like 19 of them or maybe more in, in yeast. And uh, it's amazing. Maybe there are some in the uh, others in the mammalian genome besides, you know, PRP. So she has a table here of a bunch of them and what their function is and the consequences of the prion state. So, for example, URE2, I think was the first yeast prion discovered. Its function is to repress transcription of nitrogen catabolic genes. But when it's in a prion state, it allows indiscriminate utilization of nitrogen sources. So okay. if you're under nitrogen stress, this is good. This protein can allow you to use other nitrogen sources. That's the idea. Very cool stuff. Um, and people have asked me why we talked about prions on TWIV, because they're not viruses. <laughs> and uh, the because they're really interesting. And, you know, when Stan Prusiner first proposed the prion hypothesis, the only people who would listen to him were virologists. Right. And so we follow in that tradition of being interested. Okay, the next question from the virology course is from Ashley. Hello, I have a few questions about episode 67 regarding the transgenic rabbits. Why are the researchers choosing to make the rabbits fluoresce green and not some other color? What is the significance of the green color? Would these rabbits be able to reproduce, and would there be anything that could be concluded by observing and testing their offspring? I think I can take this one. I would love for you to take it. Sure. So uh, why green instead of other colors? You'd have to ask a jellyfish that. Uh, so the the green fluorescent protein that they that they used in this experiment is a standard uh, or has become a standard marker for molecular biology experiments. It's extremely useful. It allows you to um, uh, to label live cells and and track what they're doing and where they're going and and specific proteins within live cells. Um, and it is called green fluorescent protein because it fluoresces green. Uh, if you uh, I think we mentioned this on the episode. If you if you're stirring up the water um, out of the Atlantic or some other oceans, and you get phosphorescence, uh, it's often green. Now, I'm I'm sure there's some evolutionary selection that caused that color to be chosen over others. Uh, there are there are variants of this protein that are available that fluoresce in a, something closer to a yellow. Uh, I think there's also a red variant. Mm -hmm. uh, but the green fluorescent protein is the standard one. It's what everybody uses. Um, and the reason that they used it in this experiment was as a proof of concept to show that they can get a gene into the rabbits this way, that it is expressed, that it's expressed throughout the rabbit. Um, 
And uh, so that's the significance of it. They've shown that this transgenic approach works and that it's much more efficient than the other uh, the other ways that people had tried to uh, uh, to make transgenic rabbits. Um, so that was that was the essence of what was really done there. Um, would the rabbits be able to reproduce? I would assume so. In fact, um, they got germline transmission, I believe, in the paper, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So we know they can reproduce, and um, you know, observing and testing their offspring just tells us that the gene is passed on and carried by their offspring, which is exactly what you want. Right. So this is a it's a technical paper. It it's a new technique that can be used to introduce uh, additional genes into rabbits, and you could introduce. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, some unusual viral gene. You could introduce some uh, human genes. You could do all sorts of, of experiments that would allow you to use this as a, a model system better than you can before. Um, but uh, the, the green fluorescent protein, if you've ever done any um, computer programming, green fluorescent protein into a transgenic animal is the hello world of transgenesis. Uh, it's the first program you're right. It's just the proof of concept that you can get it to work. All right. Beautiful. Bree wrote, I watched netcast number 67 as part of an assignment for my virology class, and I had a question. I was wondering if you thought it would be possible for the chronic wasting disease in West Virginia that you discussed to turn into a severe outbreak epidemic and hoove the ruminants across the country. What conditions would be necessary for this to occur? I really appreciate you taking time to answer my question. Well, has, it, has it already turned into an epidemic? <laughs> Well, you know, it's in uh, quite a few states that are dispersed, right? And up yeah. in Canada is a couple of provinces. So you could argue that it's already widespread, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, depends on how you, yeah. I mean, it's uh, already an outbreak epidemic, if you like. Depends on how you how you define epidemic. Uh, if, and a lot of it has to do with the density of the hosts to start with. And, and whether or not you can actually count them. If you're talking about um, uh, deer, um, they're, you know, not really, it's, it's not the same thing as having a, a, a bunch of cattle in the uh, cattle industry where you saw an epidemic because there are a bunch of them in crowded conditions all being fed the agent. This mm -hmm. is a, a little more dispersed. It's a natural exposure, but... Um, you know, limited by the transmission, I suppose, and, and the density of the host. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think those are two things that, plus the incubation time. It, yeah, it's a slow disease. So, I, I suspect it'll just become more widespread, and it's a matter of us detecting it too, right? We don't, I don't know right. how good the surveillance is, but you can imagine if we looked more, we'd find it more. Yep. And those are typical, even with human diseases, you don't see it unless you look for it, so... I suspect that there's a lot more than we know out there. Mm -hmm. And we have an, another question coming up we'll do next week, which uh, is whether it'll jump at the people or not. So it's another interesting one. And Michelle wrote, I have a virology question. There's a lot of concern when dealing with bacteria of resistance to antibiotics, such as with MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Is it possible for viruses to become resistant to standard influenza drugs such as Tamiflu. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, last season's seasonal flu was completely resistant to Tamiflu. We're on our way with uh, swine origin H1N1. It's not only possible, I would argue it's inevitable. It is inevitable. Yeah. With any drug. In fact, what we say for HIV, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on the planet. That's enough to encode resistance to any drug we'll ever have against the uh, virus. It is resistance is futile. Did we say that last week? <laughs> it's inevitable. Resistance is inevitable. It is inevitable. Yes. See, TWIV15, we talked about Tamiflu back in then. What is interesting, Michelle, is that there's another similar neuraminidase inhibitor similar to Tamiflu, slightly structurally different. It's inhaled. Um, the name is escaping me. What is it, Alan? Uh, now I'm blanking on it, too. Old men. You know, uh, even Relenza. As, yeah. Relenza. Also, also Tamiflu is right. Relenza. There Relenza, we go. Relenza, thank you. It's inhaled, and you don't see resistance to that. Very, very little. And we don't know why. Maybe that it's not used as much, but it sits in the neuraminidase differently. 
uh, than does Tamiflu, and it may be harder for the protein to change to become resistant. Right, and that's an important problem. point about about resistance. You will always get resistance, but the resistance may be um, so metabolically costly to the virus um, that it reverts as soon as it has a chance to. Right. So the same thing happens with bacteria. There are some antibiotics that are harder to develop resistance to than others. Uh, the resistance always develops, but then the ones that are difficult to resist, those bacteria will back mutate as soon as you take away the pressure. Yeah, I mean, the problem with Tamiflu is that it's just one. We need yeah. more. If we had a few dozen, then we could make combinations and resistance would be less of a problem. Cycle through them, yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll read more next time. But I have a question for the students at IUP. Do you think podcasts are an effective way to learn science? What other podcasts do you listen to? Let us know. Yeah. And thanks for uh, writing your questions in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think we're, it's really We're cool. homework. That's right. <laughs> but it's fun, I think, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Just listen to a bunch of guys yammering about viruses. <laughs> right. Then you get to hear your email read. Yeah. That's pretty good. Okay, science picks of the week. Let's start with Alan. Uh, well, I think I may have pointed to this site before, but it's, the format has changed a little bit. It's the Spoonful of Medicine blog from, um, this is Nature Medicine's editorial staff. They keep a, a blog. Um, if you're not a, a diehard biomedical researcher, don't worry. The, <laughs> the blog stuff is not as hardcore as the research articles. Um, and uh, it's, you know, essentially the editors uh, will talk about sometimes the backstory behind what's involved in running a research journal. But they've also added a new feature called the Daily Dose, um, where they do little brief synopses of the latest biomedical research news. Um, and I'm looking at uh, today's, you know, it's everything from the, you know, Gates Foundation um, latest funding announcement and, you uh, um, uh, prescription only morning after pill, uh, genetic testing and, uh, you know, some other stuff like that. So they give these, these little very quick updates all in one post and you can skim down them and see what's going on. And then they also do longer posts, often, um, more editorial posts. Um, and the, the next one after that is talking about research funding and, um, so it's an interesting blog to track. They, they do, you know, one or two posts a day and, um, Always very informative. Nice. I didn't know that uh, you can have now 100 disease markers tested for $698 per couple. Yep. It's getting down in price. Yep. Pretty soon you can have your whole genome sequenced for 1000 bucks. Cool. Nice. <laughs> That's open access, I guess, right, Alan? Oh, the blog, sure. Yeah. Can't charge for that. Nobody would read it, right? That's right. <laughs> Rich, what have you got? I've got... Uh, a PowerPoint presentation that has been crafted by Frederick Murphy from the Department of Pathology at the University of Texas Medical Branch in uh, Galveston. Uh, and it's a, it's a PowerPoint presentation called Foundations of Virology. And we've got a website here where you can download it. The website has got a lot of other stuff on it. Uh, uh, Dr. Murphy is a an institution in virology himself. He has a long and distinguished uh, history as a virologist, including a lot of time as a, an electron microscopist. And some of the classic Ebola images that you see are his, and he's got a bunch of EMs on this website. At any rate, you can uh, download this PowerPoint presentation either in pieces or the whole thing. The whole thing is pretty huge. It's like 140 megabytes or something like that. I saw this at the he had it going at the American Society for Virology meeting last summer in Vancouver. He had it set up on a, on a table, and I stood there for uh, about over an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and watched this go by. It's got uh, 826 slides in it and goes from 400 B.C. to the present day, slide by slide, with pictures of uh, people who are being featured or events that are being featured and uh, captions uh, that describe the uh, important event. And he goes all the way from, let's go for the first and the last, Hippocrates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who I guess uh, in this uh, slideshow is a virologist. And, uh, oh, this is cool. 
his last uh, slide is he doesn't have a date on it. The date is question mark, and it's a Star Trek medical tricorder. <laughs> hey, okay? we, we just talked about that last week. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I'll bet you you're in here somewhere, Vince. No, I think um, you are. No, not me. You know, <laughs> I'm just goofing around. Um, you got to be in here somewhere. I have, yeah, but he's got, uh, here's uh, Peter Palazzi uh, and uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastre, Terrence Tumpy, and Yoshi Kawaoka talking about flu. Yada, yada, yada. A bunch, bunch of great pictures um, and uh, really nicely illustrated slides. It's fun to look at. This is fabulous. Thank you so much. Our listeners are going to love this. I think it's great. They are downloading, and boy, I'm going to look at this. I, I used to see those at ASV, I remember. And uh, I didn't know what they I, you were. You know, this is an ongoing project, I think. And you can, you know, if you find uh, uh, Fred's really interested in making this as good as he can. So if you find mistakes, you write them. If you want to add stuff, you write them. If you've got pictures um, that he doesn't have that would be useful, you send them into him. And he puts them all in the slideshow. And this why, is awesome. Why don't we get them on TWIV? Good idea. Yeah. Th think he would do it? Great idea. Heck, sure. Actually, most people. I mean, people the guy is the guy is virology history himself. I'd love to. We could just pick his brains for an hour. Oh. Absolutely, it'd be wonderful. It'd be multiple. I hours. also put a uh, on our little schedule a link to. Um, you might want to put this on the on the website. A nice uh, bio and interview of of him that was done by somebody I don't know um, that uh, tells about his background and interviews him on some. Mm. some of his own history Great. and stuff. It's very nice. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, my link uh, for today is the Feynman Lectures. I think some time ago we, we've talked about Richard Feynman, the physicist, and we mentioned his lectures. And one of our readers wrote in, uh, Elia from Russia, and sent a link to the lectures. These were lectures given in the 60s at uh, Cornell. And uh, they're in black and white. They are fantastic. Really old style. Uh, very formal. He's wearing a suit, and uh, he tells jokes. But the physics is great. Very accessible physics. So there they are for everyone to look at. I started looking at them a, a while ago, and they are just wonderful and very interesting. I I I, I ought to look at these physics. I never, you know, physics was always kind of um, beyond me. Yeah, yeah. We do the I soft science, you and I. Yeah. Yeah. I had a I had a <laughs> I had a roommate who got me through through physics. You know, it just he he just he just amazed me. You know, there'd be a problem with something like a ball bouncing in an elevator. You know, then I'd just be shorting out, and he'd go, "Well, let's see here, F equals m a," and he would just solve yeah. the whole thing. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah he's, he does a good job, and he's classic. He's wonderful, and he's got a great Brooklyn accent too makes it interesting. So check that out. The Feynman Lectures. Thanks a lot, Elia. And uh, Elia sent us an email, which we'll read another time. We will get back to it, Elia. And that should do it for another TWIV. Uh, go over to TWIV.TV and check out the Drobo giveaway contest. Um, the, all the details will be posted. Go on over to iTunes and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment. That really helps us as well. And at TWIV.TV, we have show notes where you can find all the links that we mentioned in the show. And of course, as always, send us your comments and questions, twiv at twiv.tv. Twiv is part of sciencepodcasters.org, promednetwork.com, and microbeworld.org, where you can find other great science podcasts. And don't forget our other podcast, twip at microbeworld.org slash twip. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making another great podcast. Alan out in Western MA. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Alan is at DoveDocs.com. Check it out and uh, see what he's got on his mind, or at least what he's writing. Yes. We don't know what else is on his mind. And by the way, Alan, this week I uh, cleaned out my old lab and because uh, I've moved across to the Silverstein lab, oh. and I was going through all your old notebooks. Oh, dear. What a, what a memory trip that was. <laughs> Very. You you wrote uh, even back then. You were very organized, and you were okay. Today, what we're going to do is. <laughs> it's very good. I did that for all my students, so it was. A, it's a memory trip. Rich, thank you too. Good to have hey, you back again. It's always a good time. It's just wonderful. I love it. Rich is going to be on more frequently. We hope, right? I hope so. Yeah, I'm. I'm making time for it. I got a few things coming up in, 
in February, but then uh, then I'm pretty much open and we'll make it a priority. Great. Rich is well, at, it's uh, always, always an enriching experience. Yeah, oh. it's, it's fun. I love it. I have a great time. Uh, Rich is at the University of Florida at Gainesville, Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Is that right? Uh, actually, it used to be. It's now Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. You got rid of the immunology part? Yeah, they all split, so there was no point. That's point from, that's interesting. Going. They're all over in the uh, in the pathology department. Well, we have the opposite. All the virologists have left here, so it's now become microbiology and immunology. Hmm. And I'm sh uh, maybe it'll become immunology someday. I have to find myself some virologists. To talk. Well, that's why I do TWIV. Right. Of course, this has been. This Week in Virology, where you can learn all about viruses and you can hear about the science articles that you can't otherwise have access to. We'll talk about them here. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is Viral. <laughs>